Well, hello, everybody. It's the Brother Todd with your Victory Minute. I hope you guys are all having a good day. I had somebody, I just sitting here looking behind me. I see that I'm, I'm in my, my study. Um, uh, somebody said, Brother Todd, you had not done any of these outside in a while. Man, it's been raining a lot, y'all. And I spent a lot of time in the mornings on my hair. So I'm going to get that thing to act right. So I want y'all be able to see it good. But anyway, uh, it is good to get to be with you. We're going to start jumping in this morning with uh, something we're going to do about once a week moving forward. The reality is we're not able to do one of the simplest things we normally do to see people come to know Christ, and that is be able to invite them to church. What I'm going to try to help you to do over the next whatever time God gives us is to help you grow in being able to invite them not just to church, but to to Christ. That's the step we all really want to take anyway, okay? Sometimes you're going to hear me say this term. It's kind of a it's kind of a church term. You're going to hear me say personal work. You need to be good at personal work. And what we mean by personal work, what I mean by that is is the ability to share Christ individually one on one. Now, I'll tell you you guys something. While I am known as very evangelistic and I want to be evangelistic, I am stronger evangelistically when I get to be in a crowd, okay? I am very comfortable in a crowd. I have a, I have a, my personality types are I run almost sanguine, which is the person that loves the party, and melancholy, which is the person that loves to sit alone and think and be alone and not have to, not interact. Um, I, I'm almost a blend of those two things. And one of the things it causes me to do is to be very comfortable when I am around people, but I become more uncomfortable the smaller the crowd gets, okay? And one-on-one, -on -one, I just, if you've ever seen Brother Todd around people that he doesn't know, I tend to be considerably more quiet than I am talkative. And ain't that funny for a guy that preaches for over an hour most of the time that he preaches, or how long some of these victory minutes can go. But the reality is, I'm talking to all y'all. Okay, And so, when it gets down to that one-on-one, -on -one, I'm just not as strong. Frankly, ev evangelism as a spiritual gift is not one of my strongest gifts. It's just not. I've always wanted it to be one of my strongest gifts, but it's just not. So, the good thing is, as I'm talking to y'all, I'm, I'm talking to the 90% of us in the church, and that's about what I think it is, that are not predominantly gifted in evangelism. Now, some of us are gifted in evangelism, and you don't need Brother Todd talking to you about it to do it. My mama can talk to anybody about Jesus anywhere. She's the woman that holds up the line at the Walmart, okay, talking to the checker, okay? And I've got preacher friends that are just, they can, they, they can just sense immediately when somebody, wherever, is experiencing a call of God, and I mean can just walk them right into that. One of my best friends in ministry, Dr. Jerry Payne, has forgotten more about leading people to Jesus one-on-one -on -one than I'll ever know, okay? But it is something we can all grow in. While it's not my predominant gift, it's something Jesus wants me to do. And he said, Brett, I don't understand what you mean. Well, mercy showing, mercy, the gift of mercy, is not my primary gift. But as a pastor, it's definitely something I have to be able to do. My primary gifts, if you're wondering, our administrations, which you'll read about in the Bible, and prophecy. Not, not so much foretelling, but forthtelling. If you've noticed, Brother Todd doesn't have much problem preaching for a good long while, and I don't have much problem talking about sin. Okay, So you can always kind of usually tell a prophetic preacher, because he ain't going to preach a sermon without, without mentioning it. Okay. okay, enough of that. So what... What we want to do in, in the four people that you're praying for that you were going to invite to church and that you were wanting to bring with you and those kinds of things are, are people now, what I really would like you to do is to begin to start praying and asking God to give you the opportunity to share Christ directly with them. Now, keep, keep in, in, interceding for them in prayer because nothing great happens till God starts moving, until people start praying. Besides that, it's going to be God calls them to get saved and it's going to be God saves them anyway. Number two, you still want to keep, number three, invest in their life. You've identified them. You want to intercede for them. Invest in their life, okay? There's got to be connection. The closer you are to somebody, the more real the connection has to be for them to listen to you. Now, most people that come to Christ come to Christ through family, 
friends, relationships, okay? There is an extended period of time there. Now, yeah, every now and then you'll just see somebody walk into a restaurant and the waitress walks up and the guy says, hey, do you know Jesus? She says no and she gets, or he gets bona fide saved right there, okay? The reality is, it, why should I listen to you? I have to have witness, okay? Okay, witness is, is like two wings on an airplane. There's what you're doing and there's what you're saying. And one is as important as the other. And then the, then and then you invite them. Normally, we I just tell you, invite them to church. If, if you'll reach into your circle of friends that I can't reach into, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll help you by sharing the gospel with them, something you may be uncomfortable with. Well, now what I want you to do is take that next step. So what we're going to do is about once a week, I'm going to talk about different realities, things you need to know, maybe different scriptures, things like that that you really need to get in your head um, to begin to witness. And he said, Brother Todd, are there scriptures I need to memorize? There probably are, but that's not where you need to start. What you need to start with is reading your Bible. The more you read, the more God will use what he's putting into you right now, and he will work that into your conversations, okay? With people that really read the Bible, I can tell what part of the Bible they're reading by how they're talking to me because they'll use scripture reference that frankly they're not even they're not even thinking about because it's it's what you've been around. If you say, Brother Todd, what books do I really need to read? I would myself I like to if, if I would I might I say myself, I would really encourage you to read the book of John. Okay. John's one of my favorite books. Um, but uh, but it is, but but a lot of what John wrote, John wrote not just giving us history, but he told us why he wrote it, and that's helpful to in, in, in understanding things. A lot of Paul's writings are are helpful. Um, the first, especially eight chapters of the book of Romans, would be really good for you just to begin to read. Okay, enough of that. It's, I don't want to get all technical. What I want to do is tell you what's the three things somebody's got to do if they're going to get saved. Okay, where does it got? What's got to happen? Okay. Now, again, I know there's a bunch of you theologians out there. You might have, you know, I need to say this or say that or whatever, but I'm just going to try to keep this kind of basic. And frankly, I think some of y'all overthink a lot of this anyhow. But number one, somebody's got to know a need. And the only way they really come to know it is through the, the Spirit of God letting them know about it. Jesus said, unless the Father draws somebody, they can't come. Okay? But a need... Uh, the need for salvation, the need that something's broken, the, the reality of sin, okay? Now, mankind has this in us, okay? God put it in us through our conscience. Unless you're just a straight-running psychopath, you want to do better, okay? All false, all religion on this planet is built on, false religion especially, in, in particular, is built around doing something. It's even natural for Christians to want to add to what Jesus did on the cross. What he did, plus my good works, surely God will accept me. Okay? It's doing. Uh, if you're out there in internet land, you say, man, I don't even know who you are, your country hick. Why in the world, why do you even care? Why do you even, why, why are you a Christian? Well, I tell you, one of the reasons I'm a Christian is because of the Lord's message. And the message is to believe. It's not to do. God recognizes that we can't do. The law reigned for 1,500 years to prove to mankind you can't be good enough. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, people tell me, greatest sermon ever preached, Sermon on the Mount, and G Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And I'd read through that, and I'd feel so convicted. Well, what's really Jesus doing with it? Jesus is establishing guilt, right? You've heard, you've heard don't kill somebody, but I'm telling you, if you've had anger in your heart towards your brother, you've already killed him. I, the word of God says don't commit adultery, but the Lord, the Lord said if you lust, looked at a woman with lust in your heart towards you, you've committed adultery with her already. I mean, cotton picking, guys, that makes, that makes us guilty, okay? So what does mankind naturally want to do? Start doing good. Do, 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 do good, do good, do good. It's one of the primary reasons why the, the push towards evolution, the theory of evolution and all that gets pushed at people so hard is so that Ultimately, you may come to think that it that you you there is no there is no creator, and if there is no creator, then you, you there's no way for you to be morally responsible to him. Makes sense. Anyway, ain't got time to get bogged down and all that. That you say, brother Todd, you're just a hick. Well, I, I'm gonna tell you something. You're a stupid hick, and that's all. You, you you don't know nothing about science. I probably know a little bit more than you think I do, but I'm gonna tell you something. Unless 
the Spirit of God calls you and wakes you up to your need, you never even really recognize it anyway. So I'll just leave it at that. You got to believe that when you're when God's leading you to talk to somebody about Jesus, He's probably already talking to them, and He wants to use you as a light. He wants to use you as a mouthpiece. He, he only calls us to be witnesses. Some people want to run around being a judge. All right, you met them folks, right? Some people want to be the defense attorney. I used to be God's defense attorney, and then I found out that the Lord can defend Himself. Oh my God to defend himself and I don't need to be the prosecutor some of y'all run around you you try to prosecute everybody else over their sins God never called you to be any of those three things he called you to be a witness and and God will bring agreement remember we co-labor together with God okay but people have to recognize a need most people recognize their sinners the only people that will not really acquiesce to being a sinner is somebody that either thinks they're too uh, superior uh, intellectually and they will not listen to anything anybody else says or somebody that is hyper religious the Pharisees never could see Jesus was talking to them remember how many, remember how many times they asked are we blind also are we blind also you know they do it almost smugly right and that's exactly what Jesus was calling them and they just couldn't get it because they thought they knew more than everybody else you know your Bible inside out baby and not know Jesus and people walked all over this planet doing that. Okay, the people that crucified Jesus and brought him up for trial were people that knew their Bibles way better than I know my Bible. And that's just a reality. Okay, you have to come as a little child. But anyway, you, they've got to recognize need. So, Brother Todd, how do I really do that? I'm going to tell you the best thing to do is start praying. Pray that God will give you the opportunity to see conviction. And when somebody is, they got dropped that head, when somebody's giving you that look like they're thinking, okay, especially if somebody calls to you and they're asking you, do you think something's right or wrong? That is a great opportunity to say, well, you know, you probably already know what's right or wrong. People come to my, my office, excuse me, people come to my office for years wanting to know if things are right or wrong. 99.9% percent of them knew something was wrong before they ever asked Brother Todd. They didn't want to know if they was, something was right or wrong. They really just wanted permission. Right. I used to have a sign on my desk pointed outward. It said, what did God say? And cut off about 90% of my counseling. What did God say? And just go with it from that. And secondly, they have to ultimately, uh, they have to ultimately recognize that, that the Lord won't, is able to and wants to save them. Okay. There's a need. God's got a solution. They've got to recognize that solution. And you come through Jesus. Now, we live in a pluralistic world today that says, oh, you get to God all kinds of ways. No, you can't. Jesus was right or wrong. And he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. Period. So it means he's either the way or he's lying. C.S. Lewis put it so well about Jesus. He said, Jesus was either a liar or he was a lunatic or he was the Lord. He was either straight lying because he said he was a son of God. He was either a lunatic because he thought he was a son of God. But number three, he was. And if he was, and he is, and I believe he is, and he said, I'm the only way, then he's the only way. Now, again, everybody, you say, Brother Todd, but people want to be so sincere. Right. But let me tell you about the pride of mankind. Mankind says, I can save myself. God says, you can't. And that's why I came and died for you on the cross and rose from the grave. We're going to talk a lot about that, okay? But the reality is, they have to recognize that God is able to save them and they're not able to save themselves. And two, that he's willing to, that he wants to. And then they've got to act. They've got to act. Now, you, we can cut a lot of lines here and, and really look at a lot of things the scriptures say. I can pretty much tell you I know this, okay? You've got to believe enough to act. You've got to believe enough to act to be saved. You got to recognize need. You got to recognize that God is able and willing to save you. And you've got to believe enough to where it moves into action. And that action primarily, okay, primarily will result in uh, just without, okay, again, let's just keep it basic in confession, in prayer, in repentance. Now, the reality is those things are all tied together because what are you confessing? Well, you're confessing you're a sinner and you're confessing that, that you believe, okay? 
Without faith, it's impossible to please God. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But you've got to believe enough to ultimately act. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So that's prayer. Okay, Jesus said, if you'll confess me before me, and I'll confess you before my Father in heaven and the angels of heaven. You deny me before me, and I'll deny you before my Father in heaven and the angels of heaven. What's he talking about? He's talking about confession. Okay, He's talking about that we believe enough to do something about it. I use the analogy a lot. It's an old analogy of, of, of sitting in a chair. I look, in fact, the chair I'm sitting in right now, this old black chair right here, okay, is I can walk in and intellectually assent to the fact that that chair can hold me up, okay? I can consider its, you know, its structure and how it's, it, 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 it's the methods they used to construct it and the materials they used, and I can come to the conclusion that chair is able to hold me up, but it's not holding me up yet. Does that make sense? Now, I stand here all day long, and I will want it to hold me up because my feet will get tired, okay? That's an emotional reaction. I want to be saved. Lots of people want to be saved. I've seen people come to church for years wanting to be saved, but never believing enough to go sit in a chair. And that's when you really believe. Does that make sense? I can think that it can hold me up. I can want it to hold me up, but it doesn't really happen until I put my caboose in it, so to speak. Makes sense? Until I just put my weight on it, and it does or it doesn't. So ultimately, we have to trust. So be praying. He said, Brother Todd, why are you telling me that? One, I want you thinking those things so that when you talk to somebody, you can recognize where they are. Are they at a point of, uh, uh, of recognizing they have need? Excuse me, I'm about to sneeze. Of, of reckon, oh, that thing just went off. Man, old, old Steve here, he'll kind of lose his mind every now and then. Anyway, so start praying that, okay, are they recognizing need? Are they, do they recognize need, but they, but they don't know? They're ignorant of the gospel? Then they need to know that God loves them. God wants to save them. They need to know that. The next thing would be, okay, they know it. One of the things you'll hear in these parts is, oh, yeah, I know that. I know that. Right? But they're not willing to do something about it. That's a choice. God gave us choice. Baby, one of the ways you talked about evolution earlier, one of the ways you know you didn't evolve is you got choice. You don't operate on instinct. Everybody, watch all these Hollywood movies. They think God don't want you to know about free will. Lord help, guys. He's the one who invented free will. He gave it to us because we're made in the image and likeness of him. But I'm going to tell you something. Who much is given, much more is required of him. That's what the master said. And if you recognize that God Almighty has allowed you to know and come to a point where you make a choice and you now, y'all hear me now. God help you. And you willingly choose to reject Christ? I'll tell you right now, boys, I'd much rather, I'd much rather walk up to an eternal God one day and not have one clue about Jesus and the cross than to know about Jesus and the cross and to tread his blood under my feet like it was a common thing. If you know your scriptures, you know what I'm talking about. I'll go, I, even if I don't know Jesus and know nothing about him, I'll go before God, with, depending on the mercy and kindness of God on that, before I'll look over at the throne of God and say, yeah, you, I didn't believe in you. I rejected you every chance I got. And I'm telling you something, Pot. He said, Brother Todd, who goes to hell? I'm telling you, them people right there go. I know that for sure. I don't mean to sound too country, but I mean, I'm just telling you. Don't you get yourself there. Okay. Don't you get yourself there. I'm telling you right now, you, you, if you know everything I'm talking about right now is convicting your own heart, I'm going to tell you right now, you throw your head in, you start praying, you just, what you need to pray is, God, I know I'm lost. I believe you died for me on the cross and rose from the grave. I want to I wanna re repent, turn from my sin, and, and I want to ask you to be my Lord and Savior. And if you pray something like that towards God, I'm telling you right now, brother, sister, he'll save your soul right now. Right now. Contact us at the church. And we'll try to help you take the next steps. But that's where you got to be able to get with somebody. So start praying for the people you're praying for, that they'd recognize their need, that they'd recognize that God is willing and able to save them. Maybe he's going to want you to tell them about that. And three, that you got to believe enough to act. And ultimately, just pray. You say, well, Brother Todd, I don't even know how to lead somebody to prayer. Go back and listen to this video. What I just told you about, told somebody about praying. God will save them.
I'm going to tell you, you ain't, got to, you ain't got to get it all theological, guys. God saved a many a person that's bowed their head and just said, oh, Lord, save me. Didn't understand a whole lot. They just knew that God was willing and able to save them. They didn't know all the Bible verses. I had a woman, she said she was, she was a dear old saint. And without, I know I've been talking a long time. Needless to say, she had a really bad husband. He come in one day, said he was going to kill her. And uh, emptied a revolver into her. Sure as a word. Sure I'm dead. Eight shots. It's a 22 revolver, 25 or something. And she said, because she didn't know nothing about the gospel, but very little, but had didn't know enough to really act on it. And, and said when he pulled the gun, she said to the Lord, Lord, save me. And she said, she told me later, she said, Brother Todd, I didn't mean save my life because I knew he was going to kill me. I just knew like that thief on the cross, I wasn't ready to go. But I've known since then that I've been saved. He said, Brother Todd, I just don't think this and I don't think that. Well, I got news for you, smart Alec. Don't make a rip what you think. That woman was right before God. There she was standing before eternity and she put her hope and trust in Christ just like that thief on the cross did. And that faith carried her another 50 years. Sure as a word, buddy. I've seen lots of people come to the cross and get saved and barely be able to say no more in Jesus. I'm telling you, he'll, he'll, he'll do it. He'll call them, he'll draw them, and he uses us to help. And that's what we got to be. Well, I've rambled about too long. So I'm going to leave you with that. We'll start next week. I'll start giving you some verses, start working on thinking on things that you can help talk to somebody about. Maybe even some this week. Love you. Have, hope you have a great day. Bye-bye.